Are you concerned about whether your child has made meaningful progress over the past year in school? What should you do if you're concerned about a learning lag? When should you request an evaluation? And what should that evaluation look like? Well, today, my guest is special education attorney, Heather Zaxon. She represents children and adults in special education, regional center, and discrimination cases, and she's widely recognized for her creativity and tenacity on behalf of those whose rights have been violated and needs have gone unmet. She's a graduate of UCLA School of Law and Brandeis University, and she has been practicing law for 18 years. Today, she will address a number of questions, including those mentioned at the beginning, and also discuss the importance of early screening of language and reading. This episode is packed with helpful information. Make sure you have your pencil and paper ready, and if not, make sure you save this episode. Millions of kids struggle with learning, processing, and social-emotional difficulties. These challenges interfere with their ability to reach their full potential. Dr. Karen Wilson is here to help. Her extensive background in pediatric neuropsychology and higher education have prepared her for this unique mission. Listen as she delivers content to inform, educate, and empower parents and educators. This will enable you to identify challenges that kids face and get them on the road to achieving their full potential. This is Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. Heather, welcome to the podcast. Hi, how are you, Karen? I'm doing well. It's Friday. It seems like I'm always recording on a Friday and it's a good day to record. <laughs> I have the weekend to look forward to. <laughs> right. Get things wrapped up from the week and uh, Absolutely. focus on something fun. I'm looking forward to talking to your audience. I am so thrilled to have you here as well. I'm so, you know, I've heard you speak a number of times and and I, I think I reached out to you months ago and said, I have to have you on the podcast. And it just seems like so much has changed over the past year and continues to change from month to month. You know, we're both here in California and you represent children and, and adults in special education. So I wanted to talk to you about this transition that we're currently in, at least here in California. I know in other places in the world, things are different, even in different states, the transition out of pandemic mode and back to in-person looks different. And I want to talk about what that transition means for students with IEPs, 504 plans, 504 plans, because I feel like there, this is some very timely issues. There are some very timely issues that we need to discuss right now. Right. I agree. This is certainly front and center for all the families that you and I work with. Um, and I think for everybody, everybody who's got kids, Uh, is thinking about how we're going to, after all the time we spent thinking about how are we going to make distance learning work, now we have to figure out how are we going to go back to something else in school. Absolutely. And even if you think about the past year, for many students receiving special education services, they were receiving pre-COVID, you know, a lot of that instruction had to be adapted for delivery online. And that worked out well for some students, but not so well for others. Is that what you're hearing, too, from families you work with? That's definitely been um, the experience of the families that that I talk to and the families that I represent uh, over the course of the year. I mean, really, one of the most interesting things for me that I saw over the course of the year was was how many kids actually really did quite well. Mm -hmm. I saw that, too. Right? particularly for kids on the autism spectrum who have that anxiety component that makes it so hard for them to function in class, to pay attention, to get their work done when there are lots of people in the room. If the room is quiet and, you know, we've always sort of talked about the accommodations and and how to help alleviate just the anxiety that, that sort of comes with being in a group of people. But now we had the opportunity to watch these kids learn and relate to their teachers more or less, you know, almost feeling like one to one, right? Just the screen and, and the teacher and, and the student. And it, 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 some of that anxiety about being in the room with other kids just sort of fell away. And I was really encouraged by how much progress some children were able to make with that. And it teaches us 
what we can do to help them, right? It really does. Right? These really bright kids who just some, like, it's not that that they can't learn to read. They're just not learning to read. It's not that they can't get the material. They're just not getting it. And now we found another key to to unlock some of that. And, And for me, that's exciting. I'm not saying that they should stay home for the rest of their careers, but I'm saying now we have another tool that we've had the opportunity to prove. Yes, we've had a, the whole year to observe, and it's and it's true. I've seen a lot of kids and and reports from parents that their that their children are doing better, have done better over the past year, and and you talk about kids on on the autism spectrum, but also some kids with ADHD who don't have all those distractions of a classroom environment, who've really you know flourished during this time. And as we think about those kids, you know, it may be harder. I can imagine that it would be harder for those kids to transition back to school when they've achieved and experienced so much success in a remote learning environment. I agree. I think one thing that um, is going to be difficult is that parents, of course, because everybody's been so busy and just trying to do so much, there haven't been tools out there for parents to monitor not just their kids' pro- their children's progress, but also what they're doing to support their children. Mm-hmm. So I can talk with my clients, or I can talk with uh, you know people in groups that that I do presentations with, and ask them sort of anecdotally, well, what have you been doing? How helping to scaffold the work? And some parents, just like teachers and students, some parents are naturals, right? They can really help their children to organize the work or to organize a project or to facilitate their time um, and stay focused. Other parents don't have those native tools and and their children may not have made the same progress, but we might not have the measures for that, sort of the yardsticks to 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 say, oh, this this is what works, this is what doesn't. This is what we need to try to bring back into the classroom as we move back in. Um, that's what I'm looking for. I mean, that's for me, those are sort of the, the veins I'm trying to mine. What's been working so that we can translate that back to whatever school looks like now post-COVID. Right. And that's a really important point about the progress. I mean, how how can parents and educators assess whether a child has made progress because it seems like there's such such significant disparities in how progress is being measured. Yes. Well, I have some ideas. Please share with us. That's why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, data is is our stock and trade in special education advocacy as well as, you know, special education instruction. We need to know where these children are at and we need to be able to compare data over time to measure progress. So what parents can do is, for one thing, archive work product. That's been a little challenging through distance learning. Um, Over the course of the year, I've been encouraging parents to do things like screenshot the work that that their students are doing. And um, because sometimes there isn't like a worksheet, there isn't something that's turned in. So I've been encouraging them to to somehow print out or screenshot, somehow archive uh, the work that their children are doing so that we can compare it over time. That's a really good point, because I know for my own children, you know, a lot of their work isn't on paper. <laughs> you know, they're submitting and doing a lot of that work online and uploading it and and doing it on the screen so that's so taking a screenshot of that work is so important particularly if you have you know the beginning of the academic year and then you have what they were submitting online just before the transition back to school that's really can be really helpful right exactly of course another way to measure to, to assess progress and what's happening is to get an assessment mhm and I know, Karen, like, you know, that's what you do. And we rely so heavily on experts like you um, to do formal assessments, formal assessment measures, also over time, uh, so that we can look at the results of those assessments. So if, even if a child has been assessed, you know, in the, uh, two years ago or a year and a half ago, 
I think it's really important to go back and do as much reassessment as possible now after these really pretty fundamental changes over the past year um, and, and get the measures in the data that we're already kind of accustomed to looking at mm-hmm. the standard scores and the percentiles and th- that language that educators are used to talking in. It's really good to have your own independent data that speaks in that language so that when parents are talking with their teachers or if their children have an IEP, you know, with the IEP team, they can um, use that same language and, and facilitate the conversation. Right. And those evaluations can look very different because I know parents have asked the school to do an evaluation. And then we've had been very busy, a lot of parents calling and asking about IEEs. I'd love for you to kind of talk about that process because some parents, you know, may have had an assessment done by the school. I know for a while, some schools weren't doing the assessments because of COVID restrictions. So they didn't have that, those percentiles and those standard scores to know where their, their child was relative to other students, their age and at the same grade level and to know how to intervene, whether to intervene or whether the intervention was working. Um, I'd love for you to speak a little bit about, you know, the process for parents who are considering getting their, their children assessed either through the school district or if it has been done through the school district, how to request an IEE and what that looks like. Right. Yeah, I love talking about this, uh, and I really encourage families uh, to not think of assessments as only something that's school-based or something that's driven by the IEP calendar or schedule or annual reviews. An assessment, an evaluation, is like the laboratory tests that you do when you go to the doctor to check in and see how your body's functioning. A a neuropsychological uh, assessment or psychoeducational assessment is to give you information about how the student is functioning, where their relative strengths and challenges are, so you know what to do, right? So you know what to do to maximize those strengths and and to support the challenges, and ultimately, if, when there are disabilities or difficulties in the way, to remediate those. That will get the information about. Just like a blood test will tell you, will tell your doctor what kind of medication you might need. These, the data from from a neuropsychological assessment will tell you what kind of re- remediation your child needs, and that I think all parents want to know that. Sometimes it's a little scary to think about, you know, getting the data. Sometimes we just wish it would all go away. (laughs) Information is never harmful. Information is always essential to us. And when families get an assessment from someone like you, an independent evaluator, then that's information that they own, right? Whatever they want with it. They can share it with the school district or not share it with the school district, or share it with their other... The information belongs to them, and they can make the decisions about what works best for their family. There are ways to coordinate it with your IEP. Of course, that's a lot of what I do as an attorney. So I'll, um, you know, mention, because I know everybody's thinking about how you pay for one of these private assessments. If you can obtain your own private assessment, I say do it. Why would you not do that, then you're making all of the decisions about who does it, when it's done, and what happens with the information. Nobody else needs to be involved in in your child's, um, you know, diagnosis. Um, that, that decision really rests with the family, how other people are involved, be it the school or somebody else. That's not always possible for families. Sometimes families don't have the resources to do it or or you know, aren't really thinking about it unless the school brings it up. So um, I do want all families who are, whose children are in the IEP process or who have an IEP, all families need to know that when the school district does its evaluation, if you disagree with what that evaluation says, if you disagree with how it was done or what the conclusions are, 
or what recommendations are based on those conclusions, you can ask the school district to help you get an independent evaluation. It's like a second opinion. Mm -hmm. And the school district, I mean, it's a little complicated. The school district has the right to say no. They have the right to defend the integrity of their own assessment if they think it was fine and adequate. But very, very often, the district, in an effort to work with parents or because they get it that their evaluators aren't always up to snuff, they will grant that independent assessment. And that's a way that families can facilitate bringing in an independent expert like you can. Right. And it, and it's that's a really important point that the parents may not be entitled to a district funded independent evaluation, but they can definitely ask for one. Absolutely. Right. And, and I imagine, I mean, that is true for, you know, for a lot of kids, I can imagine a lot of parents are thinking right now, you know, we've had a lot of calls in our office from parents who've seen their kids learning over the past year. And there are concerns. Sometimes there are concerns with, with kids who'd been identified as having learning, learning struggles pre COVID, and some of the struggles have been exacerbated by the pandemic or parents are just seeing it in a way that they've never seen it before because they're sitting beside their children as they were learning. And for some parents, they're seeing it for the first time and they're wondering, do I need to have my child assessed? Um, or is this an, an expected learning lag or learning loss that's related to the pandemic? And so what do you tell, what do you advise parents where that's the, where that's the question, you know, is, is this what I should expect? And, and a lot of us don't know what to expect because we've never experienced this before, but that's a really important question. Um, because again, that speaks to your point previously about getting the appropriate intervention and remediation that's needed. I'm so glad you brought this up. I mean, you know, you and I, because we're so happy to <laughs> and we're sort of celebrating the, you know, the surprise, nice things that we saw over the pandemic, but also, right, many, many children re have really suffered academically, socially, and, you know, in terms of their language development by not being in in-person instruction in school and trying to make it work um, through virtual learning. And I mean, forget about, all, you know, all these poor families who don't have a reliable internet connection and all, all of those obstacles have, um, for some families and children, really been insurmountable. Um, and there, there was great educational loss. It's certainly true that for many, many students, there was tremendous educational loss over the past, you know, year, year and a half. Mm -hmm. So when parents are seeing that their that their children, their own children, are not parents are sensing there's something wrong, they're not learning uh, uh, on the trajectory that they should be. They're not making the progress they should be. One thing I would say is trust your instincts. Think there's something wrong. There really might be something wrong, and an assessment at school is a good place to start. To bring that up to the to your student's teacher or the administrators at school and say, look, I just think there's something wrong. Can we do an evaluation to see where they sit, where how she's doing, whether he's making adequate progress, right? Um, there are lots of varieties of answers that <laughs> I hear. You know, I'm a special education attorney, so very few people come and talk to me when everything's going great in school. Right. I don't hear when people when right. terrible. And I hear a lot of different sort of variations on terrible. Sometimes uh, the school will say, oh, um, we don't do those kinds of assessments. If you're at a charter school, they'll say, oh, you know, we don't do those kinds of assessments. You have to go to your neighborhood school if you want that. Not true. Every public school has to assess children for special education if there's a suspected need, they have to assess in all suspected areas of need. And if the parent suspects, that's enough to get over that threshold. Or if the teacher suspects, that's enough to get over that threshold. And charter schools are public schools, like all public schools. 
sometimes, uh, you know, another variation of, of the answer parents will get, sometimes the school will say, oh, well, we're going to try some other things first. Mm-hmm. I've heard that. A lot of parents have said they've had that response from schools. Right. We have to do RTI. We have to check their response to intervention. So we're going to try these different interventions. Sometimes that's helpful, right? Let's just see if some kind of regular intervention works. But generally, I think within a few weeks, you'll know if that little extra time with the reading specialist just, you know, isn't going to do it. And I think that's really important because that's probably my my biggest pet peeve is that that wait and see approach. Well, let's just give it a little more time. Let's try some things because there's no there has to be a time limit. And you just said a couple of weeks. And sometimes that time limit can stretch out to a whole academic year. <laughs> and that just, you know, it drives me crazy because there's so that was just a, a really important and critical developmental period that was missed. Um, an opportunity that, that was missed to really have significant change. Right. You know, I encourage parents to get in there and, you know, give it all you've got, you know, go in and fight for it because your child is never going to be seven years old again. Mm-hmm. Never going to be in second grade again. You've got, you know, at each of those developmental stages, there's, there, there are markers that are critical And it's really hard to catch up later. It snowballs, right? When a child is behind in first grade and then is in second grade, they're even more behind because they didn't get the first grade material. Now they're not getting the first and second grade material. And if this is a child that already has learning disabilities or some other impediments to learning, now they have twice the work to do and less capacity than than non-disabled kids. So we've got to get in there early. And it's remediation, as you know, Karen, like remediation is possible. We know how to do this. We do. We do. There's so much research on it. And and it's like one of those things that once we know that it's there, that that disorder is there, that that lag is there, we know what to do to, to close the gap and to address the needs of that student. But we won't know unless we identify it. We won't know. And we won't know where to intervene, which is what you're saying. And and that's why the assessments are so important. And that's why we talk about it a lot on this podcast, because and that's true for for kids in public schools, but also for kids in independent schools to, you know, go the the, the private assessment route and identify the struggles that their children are are experiencing and know the reason why. So that, again, you know how to intervene, which right. is critical. And I love how you said that, that they'll never be in second grade again. They'll never be seven again. And those are critical developmental stages of development. Yeah. And don't take no for an answer, right? This is, this is the time to bring it. <laughs> when you're out there advocating for your child, that's the time to bring it. And if you need help from an attorney, from an advocate, you can look for that help, right? Um, because really, children are, are, are counting on their parents to do that level of advocacy. And schools will say, oh, we have to do SSTs first. I'm here to tell you that's not true. Mm. No school has to do an SST first. They're, they're the only threshold for, for the school's obligation to evaluate a child when there's a suspected area of need is that someone raises their hand and says, yeah, we need that. We need this evaluation. It's just an evaluation. It should be comprehensive, done correctly, done by tri- properly trained personnel, mm-hmm. all of those standards. And I really would encourage parents everywhere, trust your instincts. If you think this isn't being done well, talk to an advocate, talk to an attorney, talk to a, an independent expert. and. Um, get your questions answered. Mm-hmm. And I, I just think that's so important that you you really emphasize that threshold because there have been a number of parents who who I have spoken with who've said they're actually discouraged from the school for pursuing an assessment. They're, they will say, oh, you're, he doesn't need that. Oh, he'll, again, he'll catch up or he's doing just fine or we're doing some things right now or a lot of kids are struggling with this material. You know, he'll get over the hump. And then they get that information and then they don't persist 
with requesting the assessment. Do you have you seen, have you heard that as well? Oh, a lot of kids struggle with that. Oh, all of my students are struggling with that. That when I hear that from you know the teacher said, oh, all of my two students are struggling with that. Bells go off in my head. What's wrong with this teacher? Oh, really, all of the kids are struggling with this fundamental thing. That's not that's not right. If that is right, there's a problem that needs to be addressed. The problem is not with the kids, right? And and then that, you know, approaching it from that way, well, if all of your kids are struggling, what are you doing wrong? Well, that might sort of shake a little information loose from that teacher or that principal, right? No, Well, no, it's not that all kids are, are doing it wrong. It's just that it's not that surprising that your child is, well, why do you say that? And maybe then we really need to evaluate why my child is just not really able to, you know, keep up with the pack in this area, in reading, in writing, um, you know, in math, what, whatever the area is, or not able to pay attention, or not able to sync with the kids on the playground. Right. I was talking with a parent just yesterday whose son was recently diagnosed uh, with a, a, a autism on the autism spectrum disorder. He's very high functioning, super smart in school and always alone on the playground in elementary school. And very sad because he, he sees what's out there with other kids and sees that he's not a part of it. And what this mom keeps hearing is that the playground supervisors and the teachers come and talk, he's sitting alone. So they say, no, 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 you have to play and pull him over to a group of kids who are playing. Well, that's like taking someone who doesn't know how to swim and throwing them into the deep end of the pool. If he knew how to interact with his peers, he'd be doing it. He doesn't know. And so to pull him into this group and say to everybody, okay, he's going to play with you now. He's going to be part of this group is laying that burden on on the student who's having difficulties and on the peers and all the adults just wash their hands of their responsibility. Right. Away. So, you know, in that social arena also, when that that's not when there's just something not happening when it, when a child that young is sad and lonely and feeling left out, there's First of all, the, there, there are issues that can be teased out and identified, and there's remediation that we know how to do this. We know how to support children who have those difficulties. And a year from now, that same child can be having a really different experience. Absolutely. And I just love that you mentioned that social piece, because sometimes the focus is on just academics. You know, my child is behind academically, but there are social and emotional factors that impact a child's ability to kind of navigate that school environment and and it impacts their educational experience. And that's important to pay attention to as well. And that is part of what, what children get from school. And that's part of the curriculum at school. There is a social, emotional piece that is, it, it's not just fluff. It's really front and center to the curriculum at school and to supporting children to grow into productive adults, right? Right. Absolutely. And in many instances, if not most instances, that social emotional piece is is even more important than what they've learned academically in terms of interacting in adulthood um, later on. So those skills have to be developed at an early age. Right. Right. It has to do with a child's ability to self-advocate, to understand when they when they're not understanding something and then ask for help to check in with their peers. And see for a child with attention difficulties, be able to check in with their peers and see, oh, what's everybody else doing? That'll help me know what I'm supposed to be doing now. It's really woven completely in with academic success and school success in general. You know, I want to circle back to something you said a, a few minutes ago about, you know, that sort of generalized statement like, oh, all the kids are having trouble with that. Oh, we're going to be hearing that every time we ask a question now that we're all coming back. 
I'm really concerned that a lot of the difficulties the students are facing is going to be blamed on the pandemic and that everybody's behind. And therefore, we don't need to do anything specific for this child because everyone's behind. That's my fear. I worry about that. So I'm seeing um, language coming out of school districts, um, particularly here in Los Angeles. This is where I work, right? Specifically in Los Angeles. Talking about recoupment. That we're going to have a recoupment problem. And recoupment is different from loss of progress due to a failure to remediate the child's disability. So there's this whole category that's being created um, about, you know, to identify a, a lack of progress or even regression that's going to be called recoupment. And the, the idea is that that really doesn't require special education doesn't require specialized academic instruction. Now, you know, read between the lines there. That means doesn't require a credentialed special education teacher. Maybe doesn't require a credentialed teacher at all. Maybe that's the kind of thing we have an aide sit and work with a child on. Doesn't require qualified therapeutic intervention from speech therapist and occupational therapist. So I Thing. I, I'm all about working collaboratively with educators and schools. I'm all about positive communication with the schools and, and developing plans together. But I really want families to be aware, have their antennas up, because, okay, uh, we're going to have to do recoupment for all students, but remediation has to be on the front burner. If a child has neurobiological factors, auditory processing, visual processing, attention processing, spectrum disorder, language development impairment, which is so prevalent and so often overlooked in IEPs, if there's a language development impairment, that must be remediated therapeutically. All the recoupment in the world, all the review of all material is not going to help, is not going to remediate that disability. And what children with disabilities are entitled to under the law is remediation of their disability so that they can make meaningful educational progress in light of their own own individual circumstances, including their disabilities, strengths, weaknesses, everything. So the child who has dyslexia and is super smart and so is in honors classes still gets remediation for that dyslexia, right? That's what we're talking about. And, and if they are not making adequate progress, I, I, I don't really buy that we can just say, oh, it's because they've been out of school for a year. I don't know. We already know that this child has a neurobiological imped, right, condition, something that's impeding learning. That's where we should be looking first. We should be looking to remediation first so we don't lose any more time. Most of what kids have not gotten over the course of COVID is that in-person, therapeutic, intensive remediation that they need. And I'm, and as I'm hearing you speak, I'm thinking about the first graders because they're learning to read. And for the first time for many students, you know, they're being exposed to, you know, what we think about as reading to learn, kind of preparing for that transition. And they don't have the basics phonological processing to decode. And we know, you and I both know that the research is clear that when there is a delay in reading, when there is um, a reading-based learning disorder, which is specific because it's in the reading realm, the language-based realm, that there really needs to be evidence-based reading instruction. And meeting with a teacher 30 minutes a week before class to go over the reading is not sufficient. We know that the, that the intervention needs to be, first it needs to be evidence-based and it needs to be intense and it needs to be of sufficient duration. That has to take place. 
But in order for kids to get that intervention and that level of intervention, it has to be identified first. There has to be a screen. And I'm concerned, like we were just talking about, that those kids in first grade or who made the transition from kindergarten to first are going to get missed because of this recoupment you're talking about. And the neurobiological differences that underlie dyslexia and reading disorders won't get identified because it'll be perceived as a lag related to COVID as opposed to a real dyslexia. Well, I have something that you and all of your <laughs> listeners can do about that specific Please issue. tell us. Here in California, because here in California, there is pending legislation to mandate dyslexia screening for young elementary school students. It is SB 237. And write to your legislator, get on the phone, send those emails, talk to your neighbors, put a sign in your yard. SB 237. Yes, on SB 237 to mandate screening. Do I think 237 is perfect? No, because I, it's not perfect. It's, we need it. It's got to pass. We can make it better by making sure that that screening gives detailed feedback to parents, not just sort of a thumbs up, thumbs down, right? Is, is your child reading or not reading, right? It, parents need more information, especially so that they can talk to their developmental pediatricians, they can talk to their experts like you, and they can evaluate with together with their educators as well what kind of intervention the child might need. But dyslexia screening is key and should be universal. I have some numbers that I pulled out in preparation. Please for do. Absolutely do. It's actually, it's while well, you're pulling that out, because I sat in on a lecture and I've, you know, followed Sally Shaywitz's work mm-hmm. for, for years. And she is really, you know, a super big advocate of this universal dyslexia screen. And she has the Shaywitz dyslexia screen. It doesn't take that long to administer and you get such great information. It could take five minutes mm-hmm. um, to administer to kids all the way from kindergarten, a five-year-old, all the way to teens in terms of addressing whether or not they're at risk um, or those delays are there. Yep. So important and so easy. And why would we not want the information? Information doesn't hurt anybody. It's just information. It doesn't label kids or stigmatize or anything. It's just information. We take tests all the time. We take blood tests every time we go to the doctor. We need to be doing this. So, you you know, Karen, you mentioned the importance of instruction, evidence-based instruction. Curriculum, curriculum, curriculum. It's so important. And if we had a curriculum now that worked, it would be working. It it would be working, and it would be working for all kinds of kids. Mm -hmm. I can tell you how we know that it's not, how we know we don't. Absolutely. That's why we have disparities. Economically disadvantaged kids in California, 60% of them are not meeting grade level standards in English language arts. 60% of economically disadvantaged kids in California are not reading and writing according to grade level standards. That's across the board in school. That's all grades, not broken. By comparison, right, non-economically disadvantaged kids, so splitting out those two groups, 30% are not meeting those standards. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. One in three kids. That's a lot. Economically disadvantaged. So with all of the maybe tutoring that can be, uh, that can be brought in or, you know, all the other factors, having a place to do your homework, being being supported, all the things that we, nutrition, 30% are not meeting grade level, grade level standards, just the the line. Just the minimum. (laughs) Right? Right. Students with disabilities, 84%. That's heartbreaking. 84%. That's heartbreaking. And and these are students with disabilities who are taking the CASP, the standardized exam in California. So we're not including there students who are considered to be so severely disabled that they're not taking those tests. This is of students with disabilities who are taking those tests. 84% are not meeting standards for reading and writing. That is a crisis. That is a statewide crisis.
crisis in in infrastructure who's who's going to work who's going to do the work that supports the state when these students become adults and go out into the workforce who's going to do the work if they can't read and write have to fix this now so dyslexia screening just reading reading capacity screening is going to help us do this because those numbers we can use those to hold our educators feet to the fire this has to work better from a very young age it does us very little good in 10th grade to be seeing that you know 70 or 80 percent of our kids can't read what do we do that right that, that's real we can identify that in kindergarten and in first grade, then the, the remediation that's put into place is natural for the school environment. It can be done as part of, of the curriculum. And the reading curriculum should be, um, should be one that works. The other side, of course, of reading curriculum is having teachers who know how to do it, right? Having teachers who are trained to deliver it. We have uh, a similar sort of legislative uh, issue there's a there's a, a bill that's been floated as before 88 that would actually remove a lot of the protections and standards that have been fought for over years in the law that that govern how teachers are trained in our university programs what we need is for those university programs to have real standards real measures that say we if we're releasing new teachers out into the field, they have to be taught how to teach reading. Like you're taught how to teach anything else. We would do that for auto mechanics. We would certainly hope that we would do that for, you know, doctors and psychologists. Teachers deserve real training in real curriculum so that they can be effective in the classroom. And unfortunately, there are very few standards now for teacher training programs. And there's a move in California to eliminate the credentialing test that, exam that, that assesses whether teacher candidates are good enough at reading instruction to become teachers. It's called the RECA. It's imperfect as well, but it is a test that all candidate teachers need to take now to show that they know how to teach reading. And there's a movement in, in the legislature to eliminate that. What they say is that, oh, well, and this makes me so angry and frustrated. The argument that's put forth is that, well, we don't have enough black and brown teachers. And so the way to get more black and brown teachers into the field is to lower the standard and take this exam away. Which I say, yes, ooh. Says, says who that black and brown teacher candidates aren't going to be able to pass a real exam of their abilities. Of course, they're the best teachers out there with any best. I mean, there, there's, there's, no, there's no rational basis for saying that we have to lower standards to increase diversity among teachers. And so when all for all of your listeners in California, when you hear that, when you hear your legislators talking about needing to adjust the standards for new teachers in order to diversify teachers, you don't need to buy that. We can have excellent teachers and a, a properly diverse pool of teachers to teach our wonderfully diverse community of students in California. We don't have to lower the standards and we shouldn't accept that, not for a minute. Um, I really appreciate you bringing this information to the listeners because I think it's really important for people to be informed. And I'm going to put links to both of, is it SB 237 and SB 488 in the show notes so people can go there and read about these pieces of legislature and be informed. So that when they're they're voting and they're having their voices known, that they they have the information that they need to make those decisions and and know how those decisions impact their children and the students in their class. There's a wonderful movement happening in Oakland, the Right to Read Project. 
connect your listeners with the Right to Read Project. I will. And Decoding, Decoding Dyslexia. Yes. It's an organization that's been around for a long time and is just a treasure trove of, of information. I and completely also, agree. Mm-hmm. They're lobbying for our kids as well. Wonderful. There has been... I mean, this has been a great conversation. There's been such great information for parents, for educators, and for communities to have um, as we, again, transition to this post-pandemic life. And I say that with quotes because there's still some uncertainty about next steps. But are there any other state and education policies that parents should be aware of as we approach the end of the academic year and think ahead to the next? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems like there's, we, I think parents have been hearing there's, there's funding for this and the schools have funding to address learning loss. And I'm hearing from you that maybe that fits in the recruitment category, but is there funding also for mental health? You know, we talked about the social emotional piece and the aspect of learning. Is there funding in that legislature for supporting the mental health needs of students as they transition back? There's always so much going on, even just in the California legislature. I have trouble keeping up with all of it. And I sort of choose my battlegrounds every year. You know, this year I've been doing a lot of work on reading instruction uh, and, and those issues. So if I, the fact that I don't know how to talk about it doesn't mean it's not happening. Right. I would say what I can offer your listeners is... Um, Different years, there are different funding priorities. There's a, a, a push now. We're trying to take advantage of uh, of having the ear of the new administration in Washington to push for full federal funding of special education so that we're getting the proper amounts of funding for special education from the federal government. That's been a longstanding problem. Um, you know, uh, people may be interested to know that that. Uh, the federal government, even in a good year, only pays about 14% of what states need to deliver special education. Way back when, when the IDEA was first passed, the promise was for 40%, that the federal government would cover 40% of what it costs. That has never been reached. There was one year in the Obama administration when there was this tremendous windfall and 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 lots of lots of, of momentum and special education funding almost doubled to about 30 percent one year and then it was gone so we've never really had the funds or the investment of the federal government to make this happen and parents should be aware of that because every time you talk to your legislator your candidate whoever it is every time just bring them up Hey, and how about full funding for IDEA? And by the way, how about full funding for the IDEA? Like a mantra, like a broken record over and over and over again to keep it in front of our elected officials that our educational system is only as strong as what we do for the children who are struggling the most right? That's the real test of our educational system, how well we support the children who are struggling the most. And um, we're not very impressive right now in, in our demonstration of our, of our commitment to students with disabilities. So full funding for IDEA, which would bring funding for mental health, for remediation of learning disabilities, for all the therapeutic interventions, um, for everything um, that, that our students need. And I think generally that what I would encourage parents to do is um, where the money comes from is not your problem. Your problem is your child. Your job is your child. And when somebody tells you, oh, we don't have the money for that, that's not your problem. It's not your job. It's their job to find the money. Your child is entitled to an appropriate education and remediation of their learning disabilities if they have them. Where the money comes from is just, you have to believe it. You have to walk forward believing that that's somebody else's problem to fix. Your job is to advocate for your child and don't take no for an answer. 
Thank you so much, Heather. This has been exceptional. It's been a great conversation and it's going to be very helpful to so many parents. And I'm just, I'm just thrilled that you are here and grateful for you being here and sharing this information with our listeners. What is the best way for listeners to get in touch with you? With me, I have a website. Uh, it's zaxonlaw.com. That's Z-A-K-S-O-N-L-A-W.com. And you can see a little bit more about me and the kind of work that I do. And there's a nice contact page where you can send me an email and I would love to hear from you. Perfect. I'll make sure that we put a link to their to your website in the show notes. Thank you again, Heather. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity for the invitation. I've really had a good time talking and I hope we can do it again. Absolutely. We're definitely going to have you back. I told you there would be a lot of information in this episode and we have a number of resources in the show notes for you. So make sure you check them out and make sure you keep in touch with us. Let us know what you thought about this episode. DM me on Instagram at Child Nexus Community and we can continue the discussion and let me know if there are other ways that we can support you. Have a fantastic day. Thanks for listening to Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. For more resources, visit us online at childnexus.com.